Hello and welcome to Fearless Authenticity with me, Jean Sparrow, where we find the biggest source of our successes in who we are. These are conversations and maybe some meditations on what it looks and feels like when we use our unique gifts to find our passions, make our dreams come true, and truly engage with the world in the way that we were created to serve. And I hope this gets deep because that's where we find the best stuff. But let's not get it twisted because you know me, it's all about fun and the fun of life because if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. And as I always say, let's be brave, be free, be you together. My guest today is a trailblazing history maker. She was, okay, this is a list y'all, the first African-American, the youngest, the first former player, and the first two-term chairman to lead the United States Tennis Association. She competed in tennis for 12 years on the WTA tour before, after attending Northwestern University and leading her team to a Big Ten championship in 1986, then winning the 1987, the NCAA doubles championship. In her professional career, she reached quarterfinals of better in all four Grand Slam events, later using that experience to become the first Black commentator on the Tennis Channel. She has been named to all of the power lists, Ad Week's Most Powerful Women in Sports, twice. Forbes Most Powerful Women in Sports, Ebony Magazine's Power 100, Sports Illustrated's 100 Influential Black Women in Sports, and Badass Woman by InStyle Magazine, which I think is probably the most accurate description of who she is. She's written a book reflecting on all of the lessons of her life so far called Own the Arena, Getting Ahead, Making a Difference, and Succeeding as the Only One. She is truly one of a kind, uh, but what you won't forget about this native Chicagoan is how calm, focused, fierce, and fearless she is. It is my honor and my distinct pleasure to welcome to the Fearless Authenticity podcast, the one and only Katrina Adams, or as I said when I entered the room, Kat! Hey, what's going on, Jean? How are um, you? I am good. I am happy to be talking to you. Um, and I thank you first for being on the podcast. You have always, as I've, I've expressed to you, especially when your book first came out, how much of an inspiration you've been to me watching you from just a few years behind and and how you have have just rocked this stuff like i it's it's an inspiration sis and i'm so glad that that we're able to talk about it and kind of tease apart some of this stuff no thanks boo i'm happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation yeah so let's start off because one of the things about you and and about many athletes that i think you all have in common is that you figure out early on what you are meant to do, or at least what you are meant to do first. What was that moment like for you? Cause you were like, what, five or six when you first picked up a tennis racket? Yeah, I was six. I was six turning seven that summer. And I, you know, I stumbled on the sport. Uh, I didn't know what tennis was, had no idea uh, what it would mean later in life and where it could take me. But I was a tag along sister with my two older brothers to a program that was for ages nine to 18. And I was six. And so I literally sat outside the fence for two weeks, begged the coaches and my parents to, to let me in. And once I was approved uh, to be in the program, then the rest was history. It was just a, it was a labor of love right from the start. I loved the way that that ball fell on my racket and how I felt out there on the court. That's that is so phenomenal to have that gift at so young. At what point in your life did you realize that most of us stumble around looking for that thing that we love or maybe listen to other people saying that the thing we love really isn't something valuable for so long? Did you know that that was special early on or did it take you a while to figure that out? No, I knew it was something that I wanted right from the start. I love to compete. I love that feeling of being on the court, of taking ownership of myself and, and my ability and my skills. And it was me against one other person. So no one else to pass the ball off to or run around. I was responsible for winning or losing. And, and so, and, and for developing, I mean, even though you have your coaches, it still takes two of you. You have to want to develop. You have to want to get better. And so that was something that I aspired to do from a very young age. I continued to progress you know, as I got older and was changing age groups, playing older girls and, and still winning, I just love that feeling that I had. And, and I knew that it was something special. But again, in the 70s and early 80s, 
I didn't know where it could take me. Everyone else knew. A lot of people was, oh my gosh, you could be a professional. I'm like, okay, I'll be a professional. I didn't know what that meant. Um, because it wasn't on television 24 seven like it is now. You know, you any child can turn on the, te- the television now and see it and go, wow, I wanna do that. Well, you know, I had every other month, every other week, you know, weekend, one weekend a month to watch it on television. I did see Arthur Ashe winning Wimbledon the summer that I won, uh, that I started in 1975. He won Wimbledon over Jimmy Connors, you know, and I was watching it on a little 12 inch black and white TV. I was like, wow, you can do this on TV? I still didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what Wimbledon was. Um, but I later found out and it was something that I definitely aspired to do and was able to accomplish it. And the thing I find interesting is that professionally, you found a lot of success as a doubles player, which, you know, coming from from that competitive single-minded edge, what was that adaptation like? And was that hard for you to do? Because then it becomes a, a team situation. Yeah, no, you know, tennis is, a, is singles and doubles. And I mean, when you learn tennis, you're learning as a singles player, you're learning the sport uh, and the game as, as, as it is meant to be. But I also started playing doubles at a very young age. I started playing in the 10 and unders. So from the 10 and unders, you know, I was having fun with a partner on the court you know, next to me. When I was winning tournaments over and over again, I was winning national tournaments, you know, in doubles before I was winning national tournaments in singles. So I always loved playing doubles. I love the camaraderie that I had, the friendships and relationships that were built through these partnerships on the court. Um, I'm still in contact with my 10 and under doubles partner, my 12 and under doubles partner. Um, And it's pretty cool, you know? And, And so when I got to college, you know, that was easy for me. I went on and, and I mean, I was a, I was a great doubles player. I loved it so much, but, you know, tactically and, and strategically and, and my quickness and just my game style adapted to doubles very easily. But it's also a matter of making sure you have the right partner that you have the right chemistry with, that you can have fun with. Um, and I was able to win the, the doubles championship, the NCAA championship my sophomore year. Um, and, and then I went on to, to do you know, what I did on the professional um, tour, winning 20 doubles titles in my career as well. That's pretty, it's just so amazing to be able to say it. And you always say it so matter of factly and humbly. It always, it just, and we're over here, like all of your Northwestern friends are always like, yes, Kat did it again. Ah!" And you're like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, that's my job. It's my job. (laughs) The one thing that I- It's what I do. Right. One thing I find interesting about athletes is that you guys understand from a young age that there is pro- is a time limit on that thing that you have a gift for. And you have made um, some interesting changes that not all athletes do. Right. You know, moving, you know, of course, being coaching and commentating, I think, are always the the obvious steps from the outside looking in. But moving into the C-suite, not only in sports, but in the private sector is something that a lot of folks in your position never would have done. What is the thing that keeps you discovering and knowing what the next right things are? Is it that same feeling that you got when you were young? And picking up the tennis racket, has the, is that the same feeling that guides you forward? Absolutely. I think it's something that's at the core of who you are. Um, it's the passion that is brewing inside of you to want to do whatever that next level is. For me, staying in the sport of tennis, it's in my DNA. It's who I am. It, it's what I have been raised to do. Um, It's the relationships that I've built throughout my career from a junior all the way up to today. Um, It's, it's being in those boardrooms and understanding the sport from a global perspective, not just from a national perspective and being able to be that voice and the decision maker as to where we go from here. I mean, our sport is an, is an amazing sport. Um, It's a sport for a lifetime. It's, you know, it's really from grassroots to the professional you know, to the U.S. Open. You know, we want American U.S. Open champions. And so when I had the opportunity to be at the helm and making those decisions, not from the top down, but from the bottom up, you know, the bigger the pool is for from grassroots and you can get these players in a pipeline, the better chance you have of having a greater pool of 
of champions at the top. And that's something that we've done a, a great job at. Um, if you look at the numbers and, and those that are ranked in the ATP tour and the WTA tour in the last, um, in this year, it didn't just start yesterday. This started years ago with, with a plan. Um, and, and those, those players have, have progressed and they're doing extremely well. So for me, being that decision maker um, for the growth and the development of tennis was huge. Um, and then, of course, you have your staff that was doing all the other great things as far as making sure that the U.S. Open um, was what it was so that we could fund these programs and um, to get more kids into our sports. So that's something that I think inside me was brewing to be that person, to be that leader, um, because I've lived it. I'm the poster child of who the USCA was or is um, when I was in that position. And it's something that, you know, I, I, I'll definitely keep close to my, to my chest. One of the things that I loved in your book was how you talked about uh, and, and illustrated that part so clearly. Because I think a lot of times we look at that story with Serena and Venus in particular, but also Naomi and, and Coco and the other young lady, Black women who have come up in the sports in a similar way. But <clears throat> one of the things I thought that was particularly um, poignant about the point you were making is that it's not, even though they are superstars and you got to watch that very close up as they were developing, that it's not the rarity that we think it could be. Like we always think about this pie in the sky thing. And, and yes, that, that, that gift that they have, that they all have is, is super important. But this idea that we're building a system that many of us have not had access to on a lot of different levels and how important that part is. And I want you to dive a little deeper into that because you, you did just hit on it. But to me, that's power, is building a system that creates access. And what does that mean for you? No, it's huge. And I mean, when you, when you name um, the names that you mentioned, you know, our champions, and then, you know, there was a big gap from Althea Gibson to the rest of us, right? So we had players like Leslie Allen, Renee Blount, Kim Sands, people that no one, unfortunately, know. And then you had that next generation of Zena Garrison, Lori McNeil, Camille Benjamin, people know. And then I came along, Chanda Rubin, um, Jerry Ingram, Stacey Martin, you know, some you've heard, some you haven't heard of. And then now there's just a slew of them. I can't even name all of them, which is great. It's great because when you look at, Sloan Stevens, who is the U.S. Open champion, Madison Keys, who got to the finals of that one in 2017. And then you now have the emergence of Coco Goff. Um, you have Taylor Townsend, who's a, a new mother, who's now coming back on the tour, et cetera. It's great. But there's a much larger pool of players, boys and girls, that people just don't know about. And they're all playing college. There's a lot of them that have, are getting college scholarships, et cetera. But the challenge, I think, for our for our people, for our community, is we could all develop, but the cost of getting to the next level is extraordinarily expensive. And if you don't have the your village that's supporting you, that's helping you get to these tournaments so that you can continue to play, so that you can have the opportunity, then that's where we lose out. So I, I do think that we eventually will have many, many more players of color men and women that are out there competing. But it is a challenge to get from this level to this level just because of the cost that it takes of traveling to play these tournaments, um, not just in America, but around the world to get a ranking, et cetera. Um, and that's where you know we need the support of our villages and of our communities to really be able to rally behind these players to give them that chance. We just need a chance. We need an opportunity to go out there and prove ourselves. But if we can't afford to go out there and improve ourselves, then you'll never know about us because we'll end up going to college, which is great, and then go on to do you know, whatever that profession is that they've studied um, academically. And, and there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that either. But I do think there are so many more talented um, boys and girls, young men and young women that are out there that just haven't had that chance or that opportunity to play that big tournament, to be seen, to have a win, to kickstart their careers. 
Right. And and I think we can see um, similarities in other sports as well, especially when you talk about the rise of club sports and things like that and, and the costs in, involved in that and, and what that means for scholarships and things like I've seen my friends go through that with their children. And, and when you have access, it's all about that access. One of the things that um, is always so interesting to me, that was actually one of the most interesting things to me in, in your book was... Um, some of the big challenges and, and, you know, I, I don't think you've described them as failures because there was always something good that came out of them. So I, I, maybe setbacks could be another one, but the one that I remember is that U S open moment between uh, Serena and Naomi and how that got framed um, and, and everything was that, would you consider that to be one of the biggest challenges of your executive career when you were at USTA? Well, it, it was definitely um, one of the most nerve wracking. And, and so I, I, you know, I did a book signing yesterday and I was, and I was talking about the story. I said, you know, it was a moment where it, you know, I felt it was a defining moment for me on how I handled it. I mean, I come from a broadcasting background. I'm on camera all the time. I have a mic in front of my face constantly. Um, but that particular situation was something that I wasn't prepared for. Um, when I say wasn't prepared for it, you didn't expect for what happened on the court to happen. Um, I didn't expect for 20,000 people to be booing at the situation. Um, you know, it made it feel like they were booing at me. They weren't booing at me. They were booing at the establishment. But guess what? I was the face of the establishment. So therefore, they're booing at me. But I had to, I had to process all of that in a nanosecond when the mic was put in front of me and everyone is booing. And so you know, to try to humanize the moment, uh, I approached it the way that I did um, from a mother auntie type of position to these young black women that were standing next to me who were demoralized about what they were experiencing as well, probably more demoralizing for them than it was for me. And, and so that was, that was the, that moment, that, that split second that I had to think to make a statement and approach this the way that I did. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't take anything back. I don't resent anything. And, and it's something that it was truly a defining moment for me to let me know that I can handle the, a situation like this under duress, under stress, under, you know, in, in that defining moment. Yeah. Would you say um, the other challenges in your life, uh, whatever they might be, do you ever feel like any of them were failures? And if so, or, or, or if, even if you only see them as setbacks, what is your um, process of getting through the discouragement that often happens after those moments, the questioning moments, the ones when you question yourself or when, or, or do, or do you? question yourself? Is it more like, do I double down on where I am right now? Um, what, what is that process like for you to bounce back and, and stay true to who Katrina Adams is? Yeah, you know, I credit my sport for those moments because, you know, in tennis or in any sport, I think when you're developing, you lose a lot more than you win. And so after your losses, you have to go back to the drawing board, you have to work harder, you have to analyze what went, what went wrong, and, and what went well, you know, what did you do well in those situations? And, and you go back and you practice and you practice harder and, and you come out and you change your, your strategy and your tactics for the next match. Well, it's the same thing in life. I mean, anytime you have a moment that is a setback, um, then you have to figure out how to take that step forward. You know, failure only sets you up for success, success in my mind and in my heart. Um, and I don't look at failure as, fa I don't look at a setback as failure. I look at it as a stepping stone for success because you're going to learn from it. You know, we don't often learn from our, our wins. You know, we gloat in them and we don't take the time to, you know, really analyze why did we get this contract? Why did I win this? Why was I successful at that? You know, you just kind of move forward and you kind of take it in stride. I'm like, yeah, of course, of course I got that. Of course I did this. Um, but when you, when you don't get it, you're like, oh my goodness, what could I do better? What, what didn't I execute? What didn't I add? And so that's how I pretty much approach everything that doesn't go my way. Um, particularly if I really want it, 
let me go back and, and analyze it and, and regroup and figure out how I can do better the next time. And, and that's pretty much how I've approached everything in my life. And I, and I do credit it to my sport because, you know, every day was a different day. And when you're out there on the court as an individual, you have to change your tactics, you know, from point to point, game to game, set, set to set, if your strategy that you went on the court with isn't working well. And so to be able to adapt like that is, is, is not everybody can do that. But I, I think those are the things that I've learned. One of the life skills or a couple of the life skills that I've learned through the sport that have helped propel me to success in life. One of the things I think is remarkable and, and, and it's also kind of disappointing to me from, because it's our generation. And I think that our parents' generation really thought that things would be different for us, but you are a first on a whole lot of different levels um, over and over and over again. What is it like holding that mantle of being the first? What do you hope comes from it? Um, and what are the challenges inherent in being the only one in the room? I mean, that's, that's in the title of your book and it is something you talk about in it. But I, I, I think that that's something a lot of us face at, even when we don't realize we're the first or only one in the room at first. No, yeah, you're right. I think it's, um, I think when I was growing up, I mean, I was the first of a lot, right? As a kid, um, even in high school, I won my high school state championship at Whitney Young, you know, my junior and senior year as a first African-American woman to do so. Um, but when you're young, you don't understand what the first is. You don't, you're like, okay, great. All right. I'm the first. Um, Woohoo. Cause you know, when you're competing, it's all about being the first, right? Being the winner means you're the first. So I kind of, as I was growing up, I just kept it level in, in that realm of, of a description. As you get older, then you really understand the impact of it. And I think even when I got to the role at the USDA, because everyone was saying you're the first, I was like, wow, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, that's cool, initially. And then I'm like, wait, it's 2015. We've been around 135 years. What? So, so then you really understand the impact and the magnitude of it. But the challenge is making sure that you're not the last. And so I was the first former professional tennis player, but my immediate predecessor, successor, was also a pro former professional tennis player. So I was able to open up that door for others or for the organization to realize that yes, we are business people too and we can succeed in doing this. So it opened up the pathway for him to also be that person, right? So I'm the fourth woman, we're, we're looking for our fifth. We have a couple of vice presidents at the USTA that you know, could, could ascend to be that. And one of them, which is an African-American from Chicago. So hopefully she will ascend to that in the next you know, two, four years, six years, whatever that time frame might be, but it's making sure that you're not the last in anything that we do. And and then that's something that I've always been able to focus on is reaching back and pulling forward. You know, I was someone had their hand out for me to help pull me forward. I'm making sure that I do the same um, in everything that I do. What is the best advice that you've ever gotten? Um, because, and I'm sure that as an athlete, because coaches are great with advice, right? And, and having different coaches help to guide you, um, but you having to take that and use it, you know, because I think that's the trick of advice, right? Is taking what people say to you and finding a way to use it that makes sense for you. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? And then as a coach or, and a leader, What's the best piece of advice you've ever given? Are they the same? Have you added your piece to it? What are those things for you? No, it's pretty much the same. I think the first is always be prepared. You know, you never know what opportunities are going to come your way. And if you're prepared for that situation, then you'll know how to handle it and you'll know how to move forward. Um, so as a tennis player, if you haven't trained or practiced hard, you know, before your match, then you're not prepared and you're not gonna win. And so it's making sure that you do all the hard work ahead of that moment, ahead of that performance, ahead of that meeting, 
so that you can be your best self. And in that process, be your authentic self. Um, you know, don't allow other people to mold you to what they want without where you're forced to lose who your true self is and, and stray away from your core values. So if you have your core values um, and you're authentic about that, then you'll be able to rise above those challenging moments that are there because you will be comfortable with, with whatever decision it is that you make because it's your decision it's not influenced by, by outside influencers um, because they have broken your, you know, broken you down and to where you're not authentic. So those are, those are things that I've learned, um, things that have been shared with me over time. And, and I have flipped them around to, to share with, with everyone else as well. Um, I want to dig deeper on that authentic piece. You know, that's my, that's my lane. That's where I live. That's what I, I espouse all the time. Have there been moments where you've had to, because it didn't dawn on me until you were saying it, that in, in coaching advice, there is also this molding and pushing you toward a certain goal that can often get in that, or can sometimes get in conflict with who you are. What, what gets you through those moments and how do you even recognize them? Cause I know for me in, in my particular life, especially, and as you know, from broadcast as well, people want you to look a certain way, act a certain way. And some of that stuff is professional and good advice, but then there gets this balance, especially as a black woman, like, okay, wait, why am I trying to look like something that isn't me? Because just cause you don't know what to do with it. So, right. um, that, and that's a lifetime, right, of, of, from coaching or what have you. So how do you recognize those moments and what do you do with them? And, and how have you experienced that in, in your career and life? I think the, the first thing is recognition, right? And, and it's, rec it's recognition of yourself first as to what's important. And we don't necessarily have to change who we are. We, do may, ha we may have to make some adjustments along the way with our approach, but it doesn't change who we are. We just take a different approach to get to the end result on that end goal as to what it is we want to achieve. So whether it's how we look, how we talk, how we walk, whatever that might be, we're always gonna make adjustments in those moments. You know, just the way that we make an adjustment when we walk by a fine man, we're like, mm, let me stand up tall and, and get my strut on, right? That's an adjustment. It doesn't change who we are, right? If anything, it goes deep inside them. Like, yeah, this is who I really am, but I just don't present this all the time. So it, it, you, there's always a situation where we will be our true selves. It's just how we approach it or how we present it. And, and we've all been sidelined or, or, or um, whatever, the, distracted from being ourselves in certain situations because we felt like we had to be like someone else. And I think the strength of our differences, despite our differences, are why we are where we are because they need someone different. They need someone like you. They need someone like me. They need diversity of thought in these conversations, in these rooms, in these meetings, on these broadcasts so that we can be authentic, so that we can be inclusive, so that we can be embracive and recognizing that there are others out there who are look like us, sound like us, walk like us, who want to be where we are. And it is incumbent upon us to lift them up and let them know that they too can accomplish this, but it doesn't happen overnight, that it, it's a journey and the journey is not always smooth. It can be rocky. But if you stay true to yourself and your goals, you can overcome those obstacles and be your best self. So true. There's so much I want to unpack in there. So first off, because uh, I talk about this a lot, we, you know, I think we grew up in an era where diversity meant representation, which is important and it's a great first step. But that diversity of thought have there ever been, can you think of any moments when you uh, either didn't speak up 
because you knew that your diversity of thought would not be accepted or heard even? Because sometimes you say things and it goes out into the ether and because it's so, it, it's almost like it misses the mark because people don't realize that is the mark, right? And, uh, or when you've gotten backlash because of this diversity of thought that you were brought in to do, um, can you think of any moments like that to that highlight that particular piece? Because it's, so people get focused on the wrong stuff, I think, sometimes when it comes to diversity. It's like, yeah, that representation is good, but it's, it's the rest of it that where the meat of the meat and potatoes is. Yeah, I mean, I've been on both sides. I mean, you, there's always that moment where you feel that you're sharing or won't share because it, you feel it won't make a difference, right? Because if you have everyone in the room that is pretty much gearing towards one thing, because it's their mindset, it's their experience, they don't understand my experience. They don't understand, they wouldn't understand why I would be subjected to say this or that, or try to go down a different path, because it's the minority. And so they're focused on the majority as to being successful and moving forward. And, and not really caring about the minority. And so, yeah, there have been those moments where, you know, I've just kind of just sat back and listened and said, look at these fools. What are they really talking about? They have no idea. You know, that's in my brain. I'm saying that. And then in, in the, on the other instance, I'm saying, wait, hold up. Yeah, I hear you. But here's how we're going to get better. Here's how we're going to grow. Here's how we're going to make a difference. And if we can't change our mindset and our approach, then we're just going to stay here. We're not going to go up. But you're missing a big piece of the pie of people from this socioeconomic background, from this ethnicity, from this race, from this, 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 that you're not even thinking about. And so, yeah, I've been in those conversations as well. I've been in a meeting where I was one, the only woman in the room. And... You know, the, the guys are, they're talking this, they're talking that, and they're just going on and on and on. I'm just sitting there like this. And I go, okay, all right. I share my point of view. And one of the guys goes, hmm, wow. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I never would have looked at it that way. And I said, of course not, because you're not a woman. And it was kind of a pause, a silent pause, and then chuckle because they're like, oh my God, you're right. I mean, they, they just would never look at it from a different perspective because they don't have that. They don't have that chromosome. So how are they supposed to? And so it was a moment where I think my voice was now being accepted more when I spoke. And it was a moment where I knew that I could speak more and be heard because they heard me. A lot of times you speak and you know you're not being heard, you get tired of speaking because you're just a bunch of hot air, right? But you can't stop because it's sometimes, at some moment, you will be heard, whether you're that woman, whether you're that African-American, Hispanic, Asian, whatever you are that's different from everyone else. Don't stray away from what your focus is you're in the room for a reason. You're invited to the table for a reason. Make sure you're prepared and go in and share your best self and your best ideas because your focus and your goal is to see this, this company grow as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. And, and so we have to not shy away from those moments. We do, I think, have to make sure that you have another advocate at that table you know, male, if it's, if you're the only woman, make sure you have another male or two that actually believe in your vision and the direction you want to go so they can be your supporters in those moments, in those rooms, those sponsors. You know, how often do we start to say something and then we get cut off? And then five minutes later, someone else says the exact same thing you said. Girl. And they're like, oh my God, Bill, that's such a great idea. Oh, I, and you're like, what, what, uh, excuse me. So, so here's where I have gone in that, in those moments. Oh my gosh, Bill, thank you so much for bringing my idea back to the table. Because as I was saying, and then, you know, to click and they'll be like, oh yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Kat. 
And then you start the conversation or you need that, uh, or you need Mike to say, no, 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 Bill, that's great. But I, I think Kat just mentioned that five minutes ago and, and we didn't give her a chance to finish that thought. Um, so you need that advocate at the table. Um, you need that sponsor in your company that sees you for who you are in your capabilities and abilities, who wants to see you rise, who is giving you that opportunity to come to certain meetings, to make you know special presentations, to host special shows. So because they know that you have it in you, and and those are the relationships that we as women in particular have to have to strengthen, um, but as minorities even more so. Yeah, how? Because I I agree with you wholeheartedly that there is a very big difference. Because I think a lot of people focus so much on mentorship, they forget about sponsorship and and what that means as you move forward. Talk to me about how you build that relationship and how you even recognize who would be a good sponsor. Because some of that is not about being selected; it's about pursuing it, right? Correct. So I mean, I've had I've been very lucky to have um, some some great male sponsors along the way that believed in my abilities and thought that I could rise to the top over a certain period of time. And so you know who those people are when they come to you and they're having those conversations with you and that they're asking, you know, what are your goals? What is it that you're hoping to get out of? It's like, first of all, why are you asking me this? And you're like, okay, well, let me share what my goals are. And if that person comes back to you for something else later or says, Hey, would you be interested in, or are you available to whatever that is? Then, it, then the, you know, it goes off ding, 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 ding. Oh, wow. He gets it. Wow. He's really a supporter of mine. And then you say, Hey, I'd love to, can I get on your calendar? Can I have a cup of, you know, let's have a cup of coffee or whatever. I'd love to talk to you about a few other things. And you'd be surprised that how open they are, and then how much they start to share with you on what their goals or their beliefs are for you. And, may, and what, but you have to make sure that they're in sync because their goals may not be your goals. And, and those are the conversations over time that you start to come up with a parallel um, trajectory as to what it is that you want and how they're willing to help you get there. Um, and so that's, it's a slow process of building those relationships, but you you know when the tr- what the triggers are in those conversations with these particular men who are leaders in your company, leaders in your organization, you know, and 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 see that you have potential. Anytime they say you have, if someone ever says, you know, I see a lot of potential in you, then you need to grab onto them because they don't have to say that, right? They don't have to say that, but they're also testing you to see what your response is and, and which way, you know, if, and how confident you are in sense, oh, wow, thank you. I, you know, I really have some high expectations. I'm very ambitious, blah, 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 blah. But if you just blow it off, they're going to blow you off because they're going to find the next female or the next person of color that seems to have more ambition than you do. Yep. You have to be prepared in those moments. And we all have potential. And the thing that I think we forget is that potential stays potential unless you take action on it. And that's the it that's that little alchemy that that twists it and turns that 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 air into something solid. What would you say? you think is the bigger challenge? I mean, we we both share identities as Black women in industries that aren't necessarily um, full of us. And, but for anybody who's the only, um, what do you think is the most salient feature or, or thing to overcome? Is it gender or is it race? Or, or is it that unique combination of the two? I think it's probably both. Um, I think depending on the industry that you're in, um, you know, as black women, we have, we have a double tick box, which is positive, but we also have a double tick box that's negative, depending on what industry that you're in. And, and so I believe that we as black women have to be as confident in ourselves and our abilities than anybody else. Um, we bring we bring something unique to the table because we do 
tick two boxes, right? How many organizations, companies, boards want women on their boards, right? And then how many of them want to diversify their boards through race or ethnicity? So we, we tick both of those. And, and so I use it to my advantage. I use it to my advantage. I don't, first of all, I see nothing negative about being black or being a woman. So therefore- Come on, come through, sis, come through. Therefore, it's, it, it's, you know, it's nothing but positivity coming from that combination. Um, and so I use it to my advantage in, in my conversations, in my meetings, because, geez, nobody has had a bigger burden than black women in bearing kids and, and trying to raise these, these young boys you know, in this world, right? Yeah, our black men, of course, have it have have it worse because they're overlooked. They're going to come to the black woman before they go into the black man on a lot of uh, job opportunities. But in raising them and trying to keep them positive and keep them whole um, mentally and physically, I mean, what a burden our our black mothers have had in in this world you know, not only in the past, but even more so in today. And so um, I, I look at it as a positive and, and not a negative. And, and because we, we have so much to offer. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we, we get weighed down by the burden, our brothers too, because, you know, just keeping, keeping our young boys alive, much less well and prospering now is, is a serious cultural touch point. Um, and crisis for us. And I think we do feel it. And I wonder sometimes if, if people even realize how much we feel it, but it's that, my, again, it's what you're saying. It's that mindset shift of seeing things that can be burdensome uh, that are also positive. Um, I have a few last questions to ask you that I, I ask everyone. Uh, what of all the things you've done, Kat, Lord have mercy, what is your proudest achievement thus far and what do you still dream of accomplishing? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, you know, I've had so many transitions in my life, um, career-wise, that I think every career I had, I've had, has been my proudest moment. From being a professional tennis player, um, from being a commentator, I was the first, you know, first commentator on Tennis Channel. And I was a black woman who did that. So, I mean, that was a proud moment. Um, obviously, being, being the lead of the USTA, I mean, that's one of my big, biggest accomplishments. Um, you know, to date, my book, Own the Arena, this is the paperback that just came out um, last month. Uh, hardback came out a year ago. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. And to be able to go around the country and talk about that, I mean, those are huge moments for me and, and I continue to grow and develop on that. I would say, you know, what I hope to accomplish. Um, I also say, you know, I, I run a youth organization, the Harlem G Junior Tennis and Education Program. It's a proud moment for me because, you know, I've been there 16 years. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. It's a program similar to the one I grew up in Chicago. So for me to be able to reach back and pull forward and provide opportunities for these young boys and girls to perhaps walk in my footsteps one day. That's a huge accomplishment for me and, and a proud moment that I have. But I would say going forward, you know, is to be the leader again in, in a major sports organization, to be able to share my experiences, to share my knowledge, to, to build a camaraderie within the, the sports leagues and, and make sure that, you know, tennis in particular can continue to rise and develop and, and be, you know, the, one of the best sports in the world for any individual to have a chance to go out and play um, it is still a goal of mine. Yes. I can't wait to see what else you do. All right. Final question. When do you feel that you are at your best, truest, most authentic expression of Katrina Adams? <sighs> Let me think. <laughs> It's mm. the pursed lips for me and yeah, the mm. adjustment of the earbud. <laughs> mm, yes, let me think. Um, wow. You know, just sitting around with my girlfriends, shooting a breeze, you know, where you can relax, really talk. You can talk about life's issues with, with no pressure of being judged. Um, you can laugh. We can have a glass of wine and, and really enjoy each other's company. I think that's, 
that's when I am um, my most authentic self, um, but also on the tennis court, you know, being out there, that's where I really am allowed to express myself or in any sport. I'm a, I'm a golfer as well. So being out there and, and hitting a great shot and being able to strut down the fairway and, you know, shoulder back, chest out, you know, th those are, those are the moments where I am my um, most authentic self. And those are, those are three instances, but very, three different instances. Well, the other two are sport related, but um, it's just being able to go out and, and being expressive. I love what you're doing, Kat. I can't express to you how proud I am of you, how much I look up to you. Um, and so grateful that we have mutual friends that I get access like this to you. So go thank Kat. You, right? Uh, thank go. you so much for, for joining me. Thank you so much for sharing your vision and uh, come, come on back when you write the next book because I have a feeling you have some more to say at, uh, along the way. If you find time, I mean, you know, in between. Just a little bit of time, just a little bit of time. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Every single one of my guests consistently adds another layer to what fearless authenticity means and shows me something new. And Katrina Adams was no exception. So here's what really stood out for me from this conversation. The idea that she was in a labor of love to begin with when it came to tennis, that she wanted to develop and wanted to get better. And that's the key to success. And how when you lose, that's really the time to pay attention. But yet we pay the most attention when we're winning. And then when we pay attention, it's like, oh yeah, we won. And there's not as much to learn from that. But in the losing, that's where the lessons are. And, you know, what did you do well in that loss? What did you or could you have done better? And then how do you change your tactics for the next time? Because you are going to do it again. I think so many times we give up when we lose and we think that that loss means that we're not supposed to do it. Whereas when you play a sport, especially like tennis, that is so individual, uh, for a lot of it, then you keep trying over and over and over again. And that's where the uh, perfection, for lack of a better word, comes in. You know, I'm, I'm not about being perfect, but being as good as you can um, comes from trying over and over again and not, not quitting uh, and how failure only sets you up for success. Uh, best advice being prepared always. I mean, my mama was in line with this one. You don't have to get ready when you stay ready, but you never know when opportunities are going to come up. So when they happen and you're ready for them or as ready as you'll ever be, then you're in the best situation to take advantage of that. And you can be your best self. You can be your authentic self. And then other people aren't molding you to what they want, because sometimes when you don't feel ready for an opportunity, then that's when other voices can get inside your head and replace the things that are good. Not that they can't help because they can, but there's a very big difference between somebody helping you do the best you can as your authentic self and somebody molding you into what they think you should be. Uh, and then about all the onlys she has been in the room, uh, whether it's the only woman, the only black person, the youngest person, and sharing her viewpoint as that only person and that other people and realizing that other people um, don't have that perspective because they would never think of it and just keep speaking, even though it may feel like you're not being heard, that you're getting tired of being the only person saying something. You can't stop because at some point in time, in some moment, you will be heard. And here's the most important thing she said, you are in the room for a reason. You are there for a reason. And it's just a matter of waiting it out and seeing what it is you're supposed to be doing. Thank you so much, Katrina Adams, for being my guest today. Really appreciate you. Uh, also, appreciation goes out to my Fearless Authenticity production team for making this podcast happen. And of course, thanks to you, 
listeners for your support. Really appreciate that. Please follow me on social at JM Sparrow. Like, rate, review, and follow the pod on the iHeart app, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. We also do the video version on YouTube where you can watch it if that's what you prefer. Please send us your comments, your questions, and where you're going in this whole process of being your best, truest, most authentic self. We want to hear from you. This has been Fearless Authenticity with me, Jean Sparrow. We'll see you again soon.